against the best of the Soviet. After seven games, each side has three wins and a the nation's cultural identity on the line. As the Soviets pull ahead after two periods, five to three, frustration mounts. During the intermission, the goaltender Ken Dryden says to himself, in 20 minutes, I will be the most hated man in Canada. It was the ultimate test of the two hockey superpowers. Those guys were playing with passion. Everybody knew that it's a war. hostile economic and political systems, capitalism versus communism. We're not going to lose. No way we're going to lose. This was for the prestige of the country. We are the world champions. I was like a man possessed. The Cold War. The us against them attitude was exactly what this turned out to be. So they were both entering on quite an unknown adventure that uh, took on this enormous symbolic significance that was far beyond an athletic contest. The structure of the Summit Series was simple. Eight games, four in each country. There was a real sense of mystery about who they were, and um, it was going to be a great entertainment. On September 2nd, 1972, in front of a welcoming and confident Canadian crowd, the Summit Series opened at the home of hockey, the Forum in Montreal. Valerie Karlamov scored two goals back to back in that game that were both. So it quickly became clear that the stereotype of this regime. Valery Karlamov, who's number 17, could skate faster than anybody on the edge. He's a craggy, crusty faced old Soviet player. Yakishev, he was as pure a hockey player as you could ever imagine. He had everything, every skill you'd ever want to see in a great hockey player. It was a moving style of play. They never really stood still. Their players were moving all the time. It was kind of confusing for us. Lino comes right back to the Soviet. Passes to Mihailov, coming in on goal. Point scores! One of those guys, you know, it was unbelievable, unthinkable. And the USSR had defeated Canada by a score of 7 to 3. The sense of shock that set in right across Canada from coast to coast was profound. We were tremendously disappointed. Even Team Canada's lopsided loss in the first game clearly showed that its talented players were woefully out of game shape. And perhaps... Or like along the walls and stuff, keep the puck away from the middle of the ice. Parisi jammed against the board. All of a sudden, we're finishing each one of our checks, and we're playing the game with a lot more intensity than we had played before. We had to kind of rough it up a little more. And there's a near mix-up there when they fought for that puck. Team Canada's blue-collar approach to Game 2 was more like a typical National Hockey League game. The Soviets were unaccustomed to the rough physical play, and it unnerved them. They were going to slow them down, and they're going to slow them down physically. While the Soviets were unable to unleash an attack similar to Game 1, the Canadians took an early lead on a goal by Phil Esposito. Phil Esposito has scored for Canada. 
The pressure on my brother was far greater than the pressure on me. With Tony Esposito stopping all but one Soviet shot, Team Canada began to find a comfortable rhythm. And then iced the game midway through the third period on a spectacular individual effort by Peter Mahovlich. I faked the shot well outside the blue line and their defenseman got up on his tippy toes a little bit and I made a little move and deked him and went in all, all, alone on uh, Trechiak and made a move and scored a backhanded goal to make it three to one. It was a real momentum changer for us uh, then and Vladislav uh, Trechiak who I've seen over the last few years. kind of a 50-50 proposition at that point. In Winnipeg for game three, Team Canada's energetic play continued. The Canadians jumped out to a three to one lead midway through the second period. Esposito got a pass from the corner and fired it home to give Canada a three to one lead. Bigger there on the side, Lebedev, 23. Here's a shot. The Soviets had this ability, which they showed in Game 3, to score in bunches. They could explode very quickly for two or three goals in rapid succession. Into the corner, it's passed in front, rolls loose, here's another pass, right in front, they tried to score! And they tied it up, hot enough. They tied it up. That really demoralized the Canadians. After the disappointing tie in the third game, Get go. Up the center to Petrov. Over the line, he stops. They're getting on passing players. Jake will drive. Scores! And right wing, they're closing in. Every man is up now for the pass. Here's Lachenko getting his shot. He scores! And the Soviet have taken a 2 0 lead. The Soviet power play is devastating. And they're watching their team thoroughly outclassed. I mean, this was as one sided as you could ever imagine. A perfect play by Lino. That's when you begin to get the booing from the stands. The Canadian defense is not standing up, and the Soviet player is walking right into the slot. The crowd uh, didn't seem to like the fact that Mahovlich was uh, sitting on Petriak there for what seemed like 10 seconds. And the fans were just, I mean, they, they just wouldn't let up. I mean, we were traitors at that point to the country. Things that were yelled out at the players. It was a very unsportsmanlike manifestation of this uh, fear coming true, you know, the worst nightmare coming true. Maybe we're not the best after all. Maybe the Soviets, you know, do have a superior brand of hockey, and we've been kidding ourselves all these years, and the feeling of being betrayed, or hoodwinked, or fooled made people angry. Well, it's one thing to have a crowd uh, turn on you for the way your power play is not working or anything. It's entirely another thing to have this feeling that, that the country is ashamed of you. And I think that that's what the Vancouver crowd was expressing. And at that moment, I truly think this country was ashamed of its soldiers. We lost 5-3 there, and the booing was too much for me. And then they said that I was picked as star of the game from the Canadian side, and as I'm skating, they were screaming obscenities at me like you wouldn't believe, and saying, the communists are better, why don't you admit it? This communism is better. What the... I, 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 I wanted to get my stick and throw it at them like a spear. The people didn't realize how good the Soviet team was. Then Johnny Esau started to ask me questions. How good is both teams are? With these guys yelling, I lost it. For the people that boo us, geez, I, I'm really, I, all of us guys are really disheartened and we're disillusioned and we're disappointed in some of the people. We cannot believe the bad press we've got. 
uh, the, the booing we've gotten in our own buildings. <laughs> you know, the, the Americans have their great speeches from Gettysburg and Kennedy's "Ask not what your country can do for you speech, but our greatest speech was by a sweating hockey player in a rink in Vancouver. I'm really disappointed. I am completely disappointed. I cannot believe it. Some of our guys are really, really down in the dumps. We know, we're trying, what the hell? I mean, we're, we're doing the best we can. Us guys, 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada, we did it because we love our country and not for any other reason, no other reason. They can throw the money uh, for the pension fund out the window. They can throw anything they want out the window. We came because we love Canada. I wasn't there for the players. I wasn't there for the league. I wasn't there for that. I was there for the country. Well, I can, I'm sure that the people can see from the sweat just pouring off your face that you and all your players have given 100%, and we look forward to some great games from you and the rest of your gang. When you get over to Moscow, and we can wish you the very best of luck. John, keep working hard. We're going to get better right now. Not a point. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much, you. Bill. This is game five of the Canada-Soviet series from Moscow. The fans that were at the game... a diligent, positional player. And I was just a guy in the middle who chased the puck around. And the pass was Clark, who right, 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 right. And Henderson was uh, speed, lots of speed if there was any open ice. And so with the bigger ice surface, I was really uh, anticipative of that. This is going to be good for my game. When I get open, they're going to be able to get me the puck. And with my speed, hopefully I'm going to be able to burn them a little bit. Recovered by Canada. Clark makes a long pass to Henderson. Paul Henderson's third goal of the series, midway through the second period, followed goals by J.P. Parisi and Bobby Clark to give Team Canada a 3-0 lead in Game 5. But the Soviets stormed back, scoring four goals in a five-minute span midway through the third period to win the game 5-4. With the loss, there was no longer any margin of error for the Canadians. To win the series, they would have to take the remaining three games in Moscow. And it didn't help that they were completely paranoid. With its back against the wall, Team Canada returned to a more physical style of play in the next two games, starting with a vicious moment midway through the second period of Game 6. I still never forget the image. I'm looking down at the ice, and there's Harlamov skating up the ice, and Bobby Clark is about three strides behind him. And you can see Bobby Clark here in game six saying to himself, there's Harlamov. We're losing this series because of him. Bobby Clark gripped his hockey stick like a golf club, whipped him right in the ankle, broke his ankle. But guess what, folks? The series changed. I don't think he meant at that time that he was going to break the guy's ankle or anything like that, but certainly Harlamov was going to go down one way or the other. <laughs> of course I think it was intentional. Valeri was the brightest spot on our team, and I think the Canadian coaches instructed to get him off the ice by any means. And Clark, unfortunately, was successful in doing that. Well, I got to pull a Sergeant Schultz on this one. I, I didn't know what happened. I didn't see it happen. I, di I didn't know anything about it. The story went that, that Bobby went out under instructions from someone. It certainly didn't come from me, and I, I don't think it came from John Ferguson, my assistant. He never told me to do that. Uh, I did it on my own. And chased him down the ice and whacked him. Peppers are flaring at every opportunity. That's the way Clark had played the game. Uh, and I would say probably in that team, he was the only guy that would go out there and do something like that. But he would have done that for the Philadelphia Flyers. That's who he was, and so he wasn't out of character. Clark, he was so competitive, he'd push his grandmother down the steps to, to win a hockey game. Uh, as I've often said, it's, uh, it was an awful thing to do, but it sure felt good. The only thing I regret about that is that he didn't do it in the first game. Are you kidding me? That's part of the game. 
That's part of the game. And I have no problem with it. None. You understand this was war. The six and seven, they were nasty games. When Canadians are losing, they start gooning it up. The commies now, they're not only Russians, now they're commies. What we encountered, we weren't quite used to it, even though we were warned that the Canadians play tough. I would hit them in the ribs. What did they expect? That was my way to pay them back. There were some players on that team that you could really hate. It's all extra motivation for us. <laughs> Now it was the really our system against their system and stuff, you know, and it became a personal. He felt that Mikhailov had, had given him a dirty check, and so he began punching Mikhailov, who then began kicking at him with his skate and ended up drawing blood from Bergman's leg. That was an amazing moment. Players on both sides just lost it. I was pushed, and I pushed back. So what? Phil says that I was the most unbearable player. So what? I can't stand him either. When something happens and it's not what the Canadians want, they're unhappy with everything. It's their way. And they constantly grumble. You look at the Phil Esposito, who was showing all of this. He was so animated. He was showing all of these gestures. And he was so articulate, and his face was like, like was like a gummy bear. No weapons involved. No, no shooting at each other. But everybody knew that it's a war. They were challenging us as a people, and certainly as a hockey empire. The Cold War. The us-against-them attitude was exactly what this turned out to be. I would have killed those son of a bitches to win. That, it scares me every time I think about it. Out of this furious battle came two tremendously exciting, incredibly hard-fought games that each ended with Canada winning by a single goal. Both scored by the unheralded Paul Henderson. Henderson's first game winner came in the second period of game six, although he probably shouldn't have played at all after suffering a head injury late in game five. And he said, Paul, you got a slight concussion. You cannot play. I actually started to cry. I, I said, Harry, don't do this to me. I said, I am, I want to play. I said, I will be careful. I said, I will be careful. I'll take care of myself, but please, please don't take me out of the lineup. And Harry said, well, if you want to play, I'm not going to stop you. Henderson's second game winner came near the end of game seven, a remarkable effort that gave Team Canada a series-saving four to three win. And I think I scored the greatest goal of my life, went through the whole team and scored with about two and a half minutes uh, left in the game. Henderson makes a beautiful move on this goal. This is an absolutely beautiful move by Henderson. And that, to me, was the most satisfying goal I've ever scored in my life. In fact, after the game, I said to my wife, I can die a happy man because I will probably never score a bigger goal in my life. I was lucky and it was terrific. The European tradition is you watch the game almost as if you're at the theater.
then all of a sudden you have the Canadian section. It's just a riot of color and Canadian flags. But this is a party atmosphere for us. It's a hockey game, but it's a party atmosphere. I mean, we were loud. Those fans were supportive of us the whole time. Everybody that came there, like 3,000 people, wow, they were, they, they never give up. I mean, they were like pumping us, but it was amazing. I could still hear them chanting, and one of the chants was, Da, da, Canada, yet, yet, Soviet. Da, da, Canada, yet, yet, Soviet. You know, you got these 3,000 crazy Canadians and 10, 12,000 Russian people just sitting there wondering what the heck is going on. The country of Canada basically came to a halt on the day of the game. People either stayed home from work or in their workplace, they were allowed to watch it. Business came to a halt. Telephones fell silent. It was an amazing moment. You'd have to say it was a unifying moment in the sense that Canadians everywhere across the country were all doing the same thing. The drama was so amazing. I mean, Foster Hewitt, the play-by-play -play commentator, said... You have been writing the script. Couldn't have produced a more dramatic and exciting final. Tonight, we are making hockey history. It's no longer an eight-game series. It's down to a one-game series. But even before the puck dropped on the deciding game, there was a dispute involving the referees. And Joe Campala of West Germany are the two referees, and they nearly caused a riot in the... Campala was of particular concern to Team Canada. In Game 6, he had called a lopsided amount of penalties on the Canadians. And when Game 8 started, the questionable calls returned early and often. It was incredible. You know, in the first four or five minutes of the game, all of a sudden we're from bing, and then we get another one bing. After the Soviet Union scored on a power play, another penalty was called on the normally mild-mannered J.P. Parisi. They wind up in Arizona, and I hit them. He said, no, it puts us five on three. And just one penalty after another in this game. But not only that, the guy comes to me and he says, two minutes interference. So I says, that's not interference. You've got 10. I snapped. I snapped. Parise tempted to swing his stick at the referee and it's totally intent. I'm kicked out of the game. A lot of people lost their temper over that, including myself. Harry Sinton threw a chair out on the ice. So it's a very severe penalty to Team Canada. Near down the right side to Ellis, right in front of the net for Phil Esposito. As After Canada the ugly incident, Team Canada settled down and picked up the pace. Sinton's having a chance. Here's a shot right on. But so did the Soviets. Towards the end of the second period, the Soviets scored twice to take a commanding two-goal lead. After 27 days, seven games, and two periods, Team Canada was 20 minutes away from the unthinkable.
With one final period remaining and their heritage on the line, the boys from Canada were playing their game for their country. We're not going to lose. We are not going to lose this game. Nobody in this room better quit. I wasn't the only one saying it. Other guys were standing up saying the same thing. And I think that's one of the things that makes us uniquely Canadian. The Russians couldn't compete with the Canadians when it came to spirit and heart. We're not going to lose. No way we're going to lose. Let's go out there and kick the hell out of them, you know? I just trusted myself so much that I wasn't going to let them beat us. I was like a man possessed. And there was one point where Ken Dryden was completely out of the play, and Esposito rushed into the net. And the, the Soviets just shook their heads. They said, this, this guy is unbelievable. He's everywhere. Thanks to Phil Esposito, just two minutes into the third period, Team Canada got one goal Going closer. The corner is bumped back to the net, centered it. It deflected, I put my, and I pounded it down, and I swung, and I missed it. Trecek went down, and the second one, I just went boom. But Esposito wasn't done. With just eight minutes remaining, he imposed his will yet again. Oh, right in front of the net. Esposito banged that. Here's another shot by Clark Laye. It's gone! There was no disputing the obvious goal. But when the red light didn't go on, an enraged Alan Eagleson feared the Soviets were intent on changing history. He was starting to run down to the goal judge to see why he didn't turn the light on, and he was grabbed by the guards. The police were trying to throw Eagleson out. Now we see a fight break. Now there's a so I skated over and I hopped over the boards. I'm not sure, but I, I think I raised my stick at these guards that had machine guns, <laughs> which wasn't very bright. So then we got Alan to, uh, to come to our bench, and of course he walked across the ice. He wasn't too gracious about that as he gave everybody the finger. <laughs> when that rumble started, whatever it was, nobody knows. With the game reaching its final minute and the Soviets seemingly playing for a tie that they claimed would allow them to win the series on total goals, Team Canada's unlikely hero needed to score once more to become a Canadian legend. I stood up and I started yelling at Peter Mojavis to come off the ice. I had never done that before in my life. I never did it again. And I jumped over the boards and the defenseman stuck a stick out. I tripped on it, fell into the boards. I got up so quickly, Phil just whacked the puck at Trechak and it was right there. Right, Y.A. has it on that way. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for Phil. Here's another shot.
There is nothing better and more rewarding than representing your country. And when you're standing at the blue line and they're playing your national anthem, there is nothing like it. proud of and uh, that I share this with all of Canada like uh, every time I go back there people still remember it and this is the moment that everybody has been waiting for Phil Esposito a tired bunch of hockey players a very weary gang of guys and a sensational gang for everybody and it's probably just something that happens in the life of an athlete. Americans tend to remember where they were and what they were wearing and who they were with the day Kennedy was shot. Canadians tend to remember where they were and what they were wearing and who they were talking to and who they were with the moment that Paul Henderson scored that goal. That's how important it is in our history. They don't ask me questions initially. They tell me what they were doing and where they were. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for Bell. Here's another shot right by the door. Henderson has scored for Canada. Henderson. And even kids that were not even born, they do projects at school, and I get phone calls all the time. There was a 15-year-old kid called me a little while ago, and he says, my dad was telling me about the series. And he said he got so emotional, my dad started to cry. He said, Paul, I've never seen my dad cry in his life. 